it takes years. It does. It takes years to be discovered. It takes years for someone to go. You know, you're great. I, I know someone that you you know. You're, I might not be able to put your music out on, on a record label, but I know someone else that can. This kind of thing, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day, as it say. And you just have to basically ride the crest of the wave of what's going on. Because today's music, what you listen to now, might not be the same music for tomorrow. It will change. So, you know, what what will happen is that you will have to either create that change and be there first, or just basically create your own ties. It's, it's, it's the only way I can see that, 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 that you as an individual can step out of your bedroom or out of your kind of comfort zone to be able to be someone that people actually come to look for. Because people are out there to look for things like that. You know, in a back room somewhere, you know, that they end up in the end of the day after after party, you know, hear some DJ playing cool music or whatever they've never heard before. And uh, this is fantastic if, if, if it allows it to, to happen. And these things need to happen a lot more. I mean, there's some really cool parties happening here in ABE, or some really cool nights that are happening, of which people should go and see. Uh, fair enough to one of your nights is happening tonight at Jet on Records. There's many acts that are on your, on your label that are being there to, be there tonight. You should go and check his night out. I mean, uh, and his style of music and everything is coming from Turkey. So, this is interesting to go and see. By the way, you owe me a drink. Um, <laughs> 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 Where is it again? <laughs> um, but this is, this is great. This is great that he's come from Turkey. He's here. He's come to uh, support his, uh, his guys on the label and to showcase his music. And this needs to happen a lot more, for sure. And uh, I agree with you. It's difficult, but uh, for sure, this should happen. Thank you. I think as a general thing as well, it's probably true to say that there's never any shortage of average stuff, but people are, or artists or DJs who are exceptional just can't help but stand out. You know, it's, they're, 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 whatever it is, they've got something extra. That was a question, really. Something <laughs> <laughs> extra, or like an extra hand, or extra turn. Um, Eventually, people will stand out. You know, cream was rising to the top. In the end of the day, no matter how long you how long you've been working at it, um, and, and as we see, you know, people like Daft Punk, for instance, Air, or, or Laurent Garnier, we, we, we've been strewn around for them. They're all French, weren't they? <laughs> they were, uh, but they, they stood they stood out as the test of time, and uh, and not much comes out of it, much more than that, because they're still nurturing their sound and still moving things forward themselves. So it's. It really is something of which, in the end of the day, uh, if you believe in yourself as an individual based on what you're doing, and then eventually it will come around in the end of the day. Yeah, I reckon. I thought we had another question from the floor, but I, did you want to ask a question? I had the same question. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> same question. Oh, well, maybe can you give some answer? <laughs> because I'm writing an article about young producers who are trying to sell their music here. Yeah. And I followed the guy today and he just handed out like 300 CDs to anyone. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Is that the way you do it or would you approach somebody in a different way? It can, it can happen, you know, you get that CD and you think, you know, oh, a million other CDs and just get the back of the car. How many CDs? You put, you put it inside, you know, and you think, oh my god, that's amazing. Or you think, oh, not again, out the window. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because that's what happens. It really is, is, is too much in the end of the day. Uh, based on people want to see a performance, people want to see the DJ or, or, or an act. They want to see it from its raw bones and its basis of, of the reasons why you end up being that person in the end. And um, so just giving a CD doesn't give you any history about that person whatsoever. Um, in that, in a way, you know, because it's it's difficult to, to to follow what you're trying to say as an artist, apart from that you're trying to sell your music. We understand that. Um, it, it it's just difficult. It's it, difficult to do that. Throwing your own party in Amsterdam is also very difficult. Um. Yes and no, because I mean you do have a lot of small, cool bars and and very you know <laughs> coffee shops. Uh, you, you, you know. You cannot drink in a coffee shop. <laughs> You don't, you're not here to drink, you're here to drink, you're here to listen to the music. So that's for me, I don't care about drinks or, or food or anything, the music is the reason, you know. And you can, you can listen to the music and go to another bar which has got no music, but you find that more people, or let me think, more people in a bar for music or more people in a bar with drink. That's a good question, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> so you've got to try and marry that together. You know, it's probably one of the difficult things that you have here in Amsterdam. Um, but, yeah, if, 
didn't get drink and music and cry. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, I thought it'd be interesting to talk about your people. First and foremost, of course, Lynn, with whom you've been working for 14, 15 years? Uh, yes, we have. Yeah. Tell, us, tell us how you guys met and, and how she became your manager, and why she's still your manager after 15 years. Well, this story is going to make her cringe. <laughs> she's been cringing ever since we're going to talk about it, don't worry. Cringing, isn't it? Well, I, I first met Lynn um, many years ago when she was handing out flyers in, in nightclubs. And uh, she had a little plastic bag full of other flies. I came out one night. She was like, "Here you go." And uh, I was five at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and you get all these flyers, and this kind of like, you know, you, the idea really was that you, you got to know where the next party was, this and the other. But all the parties that I, I went to, Lynn was always there with the flyers. So she was obviously into music and into going out and being there. And then eventually she created her own management company, FXTC, and then she went on to create Cosmac Management. And, uh, and you could just see that, that Lynn, her path was always to do with music and uh, eventually she was running the Ministry of Sound and also she was involved very much in Sony Records. So you have a bit of clout love, actually, um, for sure. And then one day I was looking for management and, and the last person actually I was, I was looking to, to be managed by was, was Lynn Cosgrave. But uh, for some reason she picked up the phone and, and asked her to have a little chat. And all I remember is that she said to me, <laughs> <laughs> she said, I don't really like your music, but I really like what you're doing as a DJ. <laughs> <laughs> you know, can well, we honesty, honesty is always the best policy. Yeah. And she's been like that ever since, and that's probably one of the reasons why we're still here and yeah. doing what we do today. Yeah. Because of the, the way she is as a person, and uh, I love her for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you've been working together for 15 years. How many, how many people are there to make sure that your career runs smoothly apart from you? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I do have a road manager called Ian, uh, Ian Huzzy. I do have a, a booker called uh, Ian Highmarsh. We do have Safe House Management, which has five staff, and uh, they look after uh, all the admin uh, behind. And we also have a small production company, uh, with Jim Baggett. And uh, yeah, it, it, I think it's roughly about, how many, 12 people behind the, behind the car cop show? And they, and they, they mainly work for you, or they solely work. Well, it, they, it, no, they don't solely work because the, the management company has other uh, artists on there as well. But they are involved in making sure that my life goes smoothly, really based on uh, uh, booking airline tickets, this kind of stuff. You know, basically getting everything so I'm able to turn up at the parties on time and, and do what's required uh, based on the, what Lynn sets up. Okay. Yeah. How many days a year do you do roughly? Uh, well, it's fairly six to five days in a year, so it's going to be 52 weeks, uh, I don't know, how many, 150? 125. About 125, about 130. Yeah. 130 gigs a week, yeah. Okay. Uh, a week. A week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how the <did> internet do? <laughs> yeah. About 130 gigs a year. Okay. Um, are there any amongst all the gigs you've done, any that really stand out for, uh, for reasons of the venue or a particularly amazing crowd or something like that? Well, I'll, this is a good question because it's, it's always, I mean, there's been some amazing parties I've done over many years, but the ones that really stand out, I have to say, is Berlin's Night Parade. Um, if you can imagine the story that I said earlier on about me doing school discos and, and playing to, uh, to people, uh, like 20 people in a room, whatever, and then, uh, and then after the many years of becoming that person as a DJ and then, then playing at Brandon Gates and then DJing to 1.8 million people, I think one can never forget that. Uh, I'm able to put me on the record and everyone is listening to, to, the, to my music. And I think beyond itself, because I also went out on, on, uh, on media TV and, and, and radio as well, so it's, 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 a, it's phenomenal. I mean, you, see, you can see it on YouTube, 1.8 million people, Berlin's up for eight. Uh, was, was a phenomenal time for me, but also I was able to to play in Sydney, Australia on the year 2000 and see the year 2000 in uh, on New Year's. Uh, wasn't, it, wasn't it because of the way the time zones were? Wasn't it the first major city where, where, where 2000 hit? Yeah. yeah, Sydney was the first place and then, and then I was able to, to see 12 o'clock in and, uh, and yet two, the year 2000, woohoo, where the whole place was going to go to shit. Um, actually, it was, we were, it was okay. You know, everyone's watching the clocks go back to zero and all sorts of, all sorts of things. 
Anyway, I've got to play for about three hours uh, in Sydney, and then my, I had a flight, Qantas flight going from Sydney to Hawaii, and then by, by the time I took that flight, the six and a half hours, we back in time, landed in uh, Hawaii at half past seven, 1999, and the whole thing again in Hawaii. So uh, I did two New Year's Eve parties, went back in time, and did, did the whole thing again, and this was absolutely amazing. Everyone else around me was drunk and just out there, and I was still <laughs> having to DJ, enjoy myself, and uh, I believe I had a drink after that. <laughs> That's pretty remarkable. Um, um, no, I never felt like that at any point, never. No, because I, I always feel very really fortunate to be able to do what I'm doing. Uh, and I, I am very happy to be doing what I'm doing uh, and, until one day I feel like I'm done. Because I have done a lot, as you can imagine, over the, over the last 25 years, seriously. Travelling and, and the amount of parties and gigs that I've seen. It's one thing with gigs, but the travelling and that, because that's basically everybody loves airports, right? No. <laughs> yeah, nobody likes airports. You're, you're, you're on your own, you're away from home and your family and friends and, and you're, you're, you're trying to get from A to B very smoothly. Um, but I always think that the importance of why the reason why I'm doing it is because one to get to B is the reasons why I do what I do. So uh, it, I try not to think about the, uh, the, the, the elements of, of the reason of, of what's not good about what I do, but to get to the place where I actually end up doing what I do is the reasons why I've, why I've taken that element out of my life to, to be able to do the amount of parties that we've just spoken about. Sure. Um, you're obviously somebody who's very passionate about music, and I mean, how much time do you reckon you spend on a daily basis listening to new stuff? I mean, do, do, do you put aside a bit of each day, or do you just have like little sort of listening sessions when you can? How does it work? Yeah, I, I try, try not to be too incestuous about listening to music. It's, it's kind of like, it almost becomes a chore, especially now, because when you did record buying, it was pleasurable, because you went somewhere, you met up with other DJs, you kind of uh, hung out, had a coffee, we waited for the truck to come in for the new music, and then the new, new music would come in, and the, 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 uh, the guy behind the counter would say, oh, Coxie, I've got special records for you, you know, not for Morales or anyone else, you know, and then, and then I'll be like, yeah, you know what, <laughs> listen to my records like this way, and all of that, and all of it's gone now, all of that's gone. And all I'm getting sent is files yeah. and, uh, and, and download sites and, and, and you know, all these promotional sites. It, 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 there's not enough hours in the day to go through the music against it anymore, yeah. and it's not becoming sexy at all. Uh, uh, so, uh, most of these that, I, that I'm playing are most of the records are sent by the producers. Okay. So, I'll get to hear that music first, and then all the other music that's been, been promoted uh, through the regular uh, promotional sites. Um, I tend to, to leave them aside until you know I get to them eventually to to, bear, to play them because music in the end of the day should have a, a shelf life. Yeah. It's not all about now, now, now. This week you've got to listen to it. You've got to get, you know you've got to let me know how good this record is. If it's that good, it will last. And even if I get to it in six months' time, it should still sound good. Yeah, that's the big cars still does, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It should still sound good. So. It's not all about now. I'm trying to slow the whole process of this down a little bit because it, you know we're not really hearing any classic records anymore, and it's a bit of a shame. Really. It's a weird thing because it's there's been this massive democratisation of technology, which is made which means that anybody with an idea can basically get it down in, in, in a form which which is acceptable to to the listening public, right? But I mean, yeah, there's this problem. It's like landfill a lot of the time. You know? Yeah, it's it's really difficult now. You know, you know, to find these moments of music. You know. Uh, when you have uh, uh, you know, certain elements of tracks that come out and you still remember, remember the, the day that they came out, you know, for instance, uh, um, When Love Lives, for instance, uh, Alison Limerick, I mean, this record was still amazing now, it was amazing when it came out, uh, and every time I still get to play this record now and again, I have to see people just go, oh, classic tune. I mean, I'm not sure if you can get those moments anymore these days, and also that lasts that long too. So it's, it, a lot of things have changed, for the good and for the bad. Mm. But, but meanwhile, you have to basically embrace the, the technology of what's being created at the moment for the music to be able to be made, and, and, to, and to also to, for people to, to send those records for, for the internet. It's, it's fantastic because I'm able to almost change my set immediately yeah. if I really wanted to yeah. uh, at any given moment. I mean, when you're traveling, how much music do you have with you? I have a, a lot of music when I'm traveling. Uh, I, I'm probably on my computer roughly about 10,000 tunes, okay. uh, which is basically playlisted uh, based on the pies that I do. 
uh, and also a collection of music that I basically digitized over the years, uh, which I still have a, a selection of drum and bass tracks, uh, dubstep tracks, uh, uh, rave tracks, yeah. uh, everything, any, any kind of music. You know, or wedding DJ, so I'm playing. <laughs> this is the way I'll see it. You know, you put me in a situation and I'll play it. And especially now, yeah. uh, many years ago, you couldn't do that. You had two record boxes, and you could only basically have a certain selection of which you chose. Heavy as well. And yeah, you know, I don't miss that. <laughs> Carrying record boxes in the shoulders. Yeah, I don't miss that. <laughs> um, you've kind of partly answered the next question by talking about Alison Limerick. Who else do you regard as a true sort of evergreen of the? Of the club scene? Um, well, I, I, I really do, do like the, the, the fact that you know people like uh, Frankie Knuckles is still prolific within the club, club scene. His sound and his music will still live on as, as one of the pioneers of, of true house music. Um, uh, for me, this is just, just amazing that he's just such a, uh, well, it's a flat point anyway, but such an uh, illustrious career uh, with his music, and I, I, I definitely inspire to, to someone like that. What about new artists? Um, new artists, I mean, you know, you do have the Afrojacks now, the Skrillex and Nero's, uh, the High Contrast, uh, Chase the Status, you know, you're hearing these guys, like yeah, you're hearing these guys full force at the moment, uh, and you can't ignore them, uh, and for just reason as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, I, I kind of like the idea that, that most of the sounds that, that you're hearing today from these artists was what I used to play 20 years ago. So, for me, it's fantastic because I always knew that the music was good to begin with. Mm -hmm. What about, uh, what was that Chase the Status track with a fantastic video, which is going back to sort of 88, 89, you know, where they're basically they're, they're, they're in, a, they're in a, uh, a pub and it's all sort of massive mobile phones and it's like getting, getting to the rave, you know, that like <laughs> when you had to when it was all around the M25 or something, you know what I mean? Um, well, I haven't seen that. Uh, okay, yes. I just wondered if it brought back fond memories sort of thing, because that was, yeah. it just, it, brilliantly kind of echoed what things were like in that era, it was wicked. Yeah, I mean, that's what it was like. I mean, yeah. uh, all the time I was going to a lot of these parties in the early days, we didn't have mobile phones, we just had pages. So your page would come up with where the party was, yeah. and, and then, or, or a number to go, to go and call. So, you know, we went to a telephone box to make those calls. Yeah. Did anyone have, you know, 10, 2p or, you know, or, uh, or 2p or? Yeah, it was 2 and 10, yeah. Yeah, 2 and 10. And most people didn't have to. <laughs> so we didn't know where the party was unless someone had some money. But uh, that's what it used to be like, and, and if I hope of our crew we used to get to those parties in the end for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> Bloody hell. Oh, yeah, your own music. We've done enough about DJ now. I mean, you've done a lot of music as well. I mean, do you have a favourite own track? Um, yeah, it's. <laughs> It's quite difficult, really, uh, to have one particular track that stood out for me. I mean, I've always kind of been under the wire when it comes to making music, you know. Uh, I've done I'm on my fourth album now, and uh, I'm very happy to get to this, this, part, this part of my life where I'm able to look back on, on the records that I've done. But I suppose if, if the one record I, was, uh, I would say that, that really was the Talcott sound of the 90s, and it's a track which came out on Perfecto Records called I'm Wondy Forever. And, uh, and when people first heard this record, they basically got behind me as an artist. And, and this was for me the, the, the turning point of me making music. Uh, when Paul Ankenfold asked me to become an artist and, and to be signed by them, uh, this record just came out the back, basically put it together, we really sent it out, and uh, nearly every DJ on the planet was playing this record. It really hit the dance charts number one. It went worldwide uh, in all the, all the prolific charts. And, uh, and for me, this was when the name Carl Cox then went from the DJ into, into performing pop artists. So I was one of the first DJs that crossed over and into the pop world with that record. And I guess that, that track also got you an awful lot of remix work, didn't it? it the remix work did come across, but I really didn't play the remix game. Um, I, I only remix music if I feel that I can give, create an essence to that track. Otherwise, if it's not broke, I don't fix it. Uh, I actually turn down more remixes than I do. I think that's a very, very honourable attitude, but I have to say, I think I mentioned this in the notes, that your remix of Tomorrow, uh, the Vector Lovers mix, um, by Lady Drop. Yeah. Oh, God, it's <laughs> amazing. It's just so, it completely gets the essence of the song, but transforms it into something else, totally. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I had the opportunity to do something 
uh, conceptual with this track, and uh, and for me that was what Remix was all about. Yeah. Was, was to was to to still keep the the the, the essence of what the, the track was was originally and respect that, yeah. and then to, just give the, the cold cox twist to to put it on the dance floor, which makes sense to me, and hopefully other people want to listen to that music. Uh, and that was was one of the basis of me doing remixes in the first place. So I did we remixes for Stone Roses. Uh, uh, did be mixes for Shujang and Spoon, um, and the list goes on really, uh, based on how many remixes I've done. But uh, for me, they were all very good quality remixes based on the Cold Cox sound. Yeah. Um, do you have a fixed way of working? When you've, I mean, when, once you've actually decided you're going to do a track, uh, how, do you, how do you work? I mean, how do you... Because the thing is, you could fiddle endlessly, right? Yeah. I mean, how do, you, how do you discipline yourself and how do you organise it? Within, within any, any record structure, there's always a, a, a main hook of the song. So I always take that main hook of the song. What makes this record great? That hook. So don't get rid of it. You know, keep that hook in there. And then create good bass lines and good drum rhythms and just a good powerful energy around the, the original hook of the song. And I think you'll find that no matter what I've done with it, you get to that hook and you go, ah, that's, that's the artist. And uh, and I always try to always I always try to keep that uh, uh, the uh, the I would say I always try to keep the idea of, of, of following the path of the original track, but also just sprinkling a bit of cold cox gold dust on top of that to make it what I think should be a cold cox remix. Well, time rapidly, it's been yeah. fun. But before we go, we've got to talk about all roads lead to the dance floor. Now, I think it was a total stroke of genius. A to have an updated, permanently updated USB key as the sound carrier, as they yeah. used to be called, but also flogging it with a t-shirt, that's genius. <laughs> <laughs> Whose idea is that? Um, I was a, it's a collective actually with uh, my guys uh, that are working within the, the structure of uh, Safe House, so Elliot and, uh, and John Mundell that, that helped run the, uh, the, the label for me. Um, and the idea to, bun to bundle the, the t-shirt on with the USB was, was that actually the t-shirts will get a, a lot of attention also. So, uh, uh, based on what they are, it just says all roads leads to the dance floor, and that's the end of it. But when, we, when people see it, they kind of think, okay, they actually do, because I, as a, as a, uh, uh, as a punter, I always end up on the dance floor, and, and the roads get me there. So, so uh, this was something which kind of popped up, and, and, uh, and as a concept idea, we just thought it was just really, uh, if you're a Cold Cox fan, then you should be able to get something a bit more than just the music, uh, which which you're able to wear with pride. <laughs> yeah, and I think also it's kind of, it, it's it providing a solution to the fact that people are so, like we, we touched on earlier, people are so much less bothered about acquiring music because it's everywhere, right? And it, the, the mystique to a certain degree is, is, is gone, so you have to provide some, like an extra service or an extra element, right? Well, well the thing is now is that when you're obtaining music now, you're just downloading it onto your IP, uh, MP3 player or your computer these days, and you don't get to feel or touch anything anymore. So my idea with the USB stick was that you actually got something tangible. You bought something of which you, you have in your hand, and you can basically show your friends, show off and say, look what I got, you know, this is something on which is, is something that I, I bought into as a point of Carl Fox history, and if you're a fan of me or anyone else that decides to use, utilize the USB the technology to, to basically obtain music, then there it is. And uh, I kind of like the idea of that, that you actually, you've actually got something that you own from, from the idea of obtaining music. Uh, and, and for me it's quite exciting because now we're on to phase two of the album in the sense of download, yeah. And uh, people are very interested in seeing what they're going to get next. Yeah. Oh, what they've already bought into to begin with. Yeah. And then, then we've got phrase three that's coming up, and you never know, they might get another t shirt down the line, who knows? Uh, or, or, or a mug, or, or <laughs> pencil, or I don't know, <laughs> what's that, a rucksack, or something. But no lawnmower. <laughs> no lawnmower, is that? You can, go for it. Yeah, thank you. Hello? Um, I would like to ask about uh, how you organize your play, your play per, per, per year. You say 147 yeah. Uh, yeah, and this is very quite a lot and it's very good. And I uh, wish you would have 300 per year. <laughs> I would just like to ask about how you organize your time for your tracks and how you have the time for gig and track and the time for manager, of course. Yeah. And how old is, how you do that? Yeah, no, I mean, any given moment, you know, that I get to, to to listen to music, 
It's, it's just it's just difficult. You have to try and make the time to do it because obviously if I don't listen to new music and then I'm going to be playing the same records I actually want in January, then I will be in December. So within that, I, I have no choice but to find a given moment to listen to music. And it is difficult, uh, but you just have to do it. Yeah. Do you have somebody from a company with you in the studio when you do a track and you start with a loop for the first beat? Somebody maybe help you to do it together when no. you don't have the time? No, I can't do that because someone's idea of good music is not my idea of good music. So it's difficult for someone to say, oh, I think I should be playing these records, and I'll get these records and I think they're crap. So therefore, I can't do it. I have to do it myself. Everything that you hear me play is what I've chosen directly. That's it. Okay, I was just talking about the time. Maybe you send somebody to do this one for you. Yeah. You don't have the time because you fly a lot. Okay? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's a good question because, you know, I don't have the time to listen to everything, but I have to try and make the time to try and listen to at least as, as, many, as many records as possible. And, uh, and for me, but it's important for me to know what, what I'm playing and why I'm playing. It. And, uh, and the only way I can do that is for me to listen to the records to begin with. And about, uh, for example, to have a manager and to travel a lot like this, how would that feel? For you as an artist, it's quite stress or, or no? It's, it's or quite it's quite fun to, to have my tour manager uh, to be with me because basically we we we've grown into friends, of course, because he's been with me for the last ten years. But then and then my actual manager gets to come and see me play now and again, so you know that's quite exciting when she comes to see me play because all the time she's in the office and she's looking me out and never gets the benefits of seeing what she's actually creating for me as well. Um, but now we are a team uh, as a whole. Yes, I'm the figurehead of the team. But meanwhile, the team work really hard behind me, and all I can do is basically play well based on other work that they've done as well for me. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. Um, favorite gadget? Um, my favorite gadget, I suppose, is uh, my iPad. Mm -hmm. uh, iPad 2 now, as a recording tool, as a reading tool. As, uh, it's a tool, isn't it? <laughs> It's, 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 it's amazing what you can do with this thing now, yeah. and, uh, and, I, and I just don't leave home without it at all. You know, when I'm watching movies or, or I, I, I want to Skype to my mum and my dad, you know, that's brilliant. And you're looking at me, you know, you're, you're away from home, and, and uh, my mum's kind of tapping onto the screen. Oh, I can see my son. It's it's a you know, she comes from the fifties, so you know, talking the, the yeah, yeah. technology to my mum is like. Phew. But she's able to do one thing and has to get on Skype, so just for that, yeah. gets a yeah. double thumbs up for me. So you also use your iPad as a, as a composing tool? Yeah. yeah, I kind of tinker around on, uh, it's called uh, Pianist Pro, and you can basically create sim sounds and ideas and uh, uh, around uh, what you're thinking of right, right there and then. Yeah. So I'll sit there with an idea and I think, oh, right, bass lines or whatever, do do the Pianist Pro, fantastic. Mm. Do you use anything else for recording or composing? Uh, no, just, just, just that really. I mean, on my, on my uh, computer, uh, I use Ableton Live to, to, to take it to another step, to another level. Yeah. But just on the iPad is, is enough for me just to, to be able to have the initial ideas to begin with uh, based on what's going on in my head and I'll get to PN, uh, Pianist Pro, mm -hmm. which basically you can make songs, you can save them, and you can get back to them eventually. And you can actually keep, keep creating and keep composing. Maybe one day I'll do a track just with the app. Pianist Pro. Yeah, I absolutely love it. That, that for me is one of the best. Somebody, some someday soon is going to do exactly that, right? Yes. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, looking to the future, uh, you your gig schedule is pretty bloody heavy. Um, do you have a fancy? Do you ever think about slowing down a little bit? Maybe a bit more time for yourself, a bit more time for other things. Yeah, I, I do. I do think about slowing down because you know, you know, you know, time's ticking away now. It's getting to a point where. In my life can't be just about performing and just about, about being a DJ. Uh, eventually, you know, I would like to meet the right person and have a family and you know, that can carry on the family tradition and this sort of stuff. All the time I'm away, that's never going to happen. So I'm going to have to pull back a little bit eventually just to have a bit more quality of life for myself. Yeah. And uh, I think that goes for anyone, if you're an actor or, or if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're overseas. Uh, uh, as a soldier and this sort of stuff, you, you do think about these things. Yeah. And, uh, and me as a DJ, it's brilliant that I have this amazing and illustrious career, but you know, it has taken a toll on my personal life. So for me, it's, it's important that I do pull back a little bit to have a bit of, a bit of a life for myself too. Sure. Um, and when you're not listening to music, traveling, DJ, composing, etc., etc., what other stuff do you do? Um, well, if not, anything. Yeah, not many people know this, but I really, uh, into my motorcycles. I, I really enjoy 
the, the fact that I'm out on two wheels, got a crash helmet on, no one can see who I am, go out in the wilderness, and they really enjoy the roads and bends and really get into, into being a, a biker. Uh, I like that. It's been within my blood for many, many years. I've always, I've always travelled with two wheels. Uh, most of my life, uh, uh, I, was, I was, most of my life I've been in a car. I've enjoyed my car, but I, I'm much more happier being on two wheels. Mm. Brilliant. Mate, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, <laughs> audience, for staying there. Thank you. Thank you.